Hey everybody, thanks for coming. I uh, know you had a couple choices where you wanted to go, so I'm glad you picked mine because D3 is awesome. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna talk today, um, before I get started, just a brief introduction to myself. My name is Justin McMurdy. I'm a software engineer at Allianza. That's in the bottom right. I interned at Domo and Client Success, which is where I picked up a lot of my D3 uh, skills. I went to BYU and I graduated from there, um, and I play way too much Destiny. So if you uh, ever want to play some Destiny, let me know. PlayStation 4. All right. All right, so before we get started, I'd like to do an overview. We're going to talk about what D3JS is and what it isn't. Some common uses. Uh, we're going to do an introduction to SVG and D3 and then together. And then hopefully if we have time, we'll walk through building a chart. Um, so D3JS is at its core a data binding library. It's not a charting library. Um, it has a lot of helpers to make it easy to build charts, but it really enables you to arbitrarily bind data to the DOM. So some common uses, obviously charts. That's the biggest one, um, and usually with SVG. But you can use it for other things. Some are not recommended. Um, before I learned, discovered Angular, um, I would use D3 to create my own web components. SVG stands for Scalable Vector Graphics. It is a, um, a kind of like a PNG, an image, but it's computed rather than stored, and so it can scale as much as or as little as possible. Yep, it's vector-based. Um, and so I would build uh, directives, essentially, in Angular, but with D3, just reusable components. Eventually, I discovered Angular, and I realized that there are better and easier ways to do what I was doing. Um, so there are some chart libraries that are built on top of D3. <coughs> There's NVD3 and PicCharts. Those are two that I have played with, not extensively. And then there are support libraries like D3.chart. Um, and that just makes it a little bit easier to build charts. So again, D3 is not a charting library, but it can be used to build charts. All right. so. D3, um, what can it do? Why are, I mean, you're here because you want to learn it or learn how to use it, but I always like to show these because they're awesome. So D3 was created by a gentleman named Mike Bostock, and he worked for the New York Times uh, creating visualizations. This is one of my favorite visualizations. Uh, it happens to be political. That's irrelevant. Let's look at the uh, visualization. So you have a bunch of circles here. They're weighted together. Um, and there's a scale over here to show how money is being spent. In this case, it was a budget proposal. Uh, you can separate it into types of spending with a user interaction. You can look at the changes, another user interaction. And then you can look at department totals. So D3 can do a lot. There's a lot of helper functions that enable this. Um, we're not going to build this today, unfortunately. Um, I'd like to, but uh, we'll have to save that for later. Uh, my wife speaks fluent French, and so uh, all, of our, all of our children will have French names. Um, and so this is a, uh, a visualization that I like a lot. It, so I can look at French, the first name in French, first French names over time. So you can see that this particular name was pretty popular in 1970. And you can compare it with other names. So I'm going to add a couple here, and you oh, well, this one's throwing everything off, so let me adjust. Uh, let's see, what's, what's a Isabel? That's a very traditional name. And you can even jump in to look at certain. So these are, these are the types of things that D3 can do, very interactive visualizations to work, allow your users to look at the data they want to see. Um, and I'll show one more. I like this one because it's fun. This happens to be another political one. Uh, I guess you can see what I care about. Um, this happens to be national conventions uh, for the 2012 elections and what words were used by each, each party. Um, so you can see that the word Romney was used more uh, by the conservative party. Um, and jobs was used about the same. There's one that's obviously missing. At, oh, look, I just added that in. And I can see how many times the word was used. So there's a, there's a lot of power in D3, um, and these are really cool uh, visualizations. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I don't think we're all at the skill level to build these. So let's talk about um, 
a very contrived example. So let's say I have a blog and I want to uh, display n number of paragraphs. You know, I don't want to deal with it. HTML is gross. I don't really want to have to type it all. Um, and so this is a vanilla JavaScript way to solve it. There are many better ways. This is not the best way. So I've got my data. This would be, in the real world, an array of uh, objects that contain titles and, pair and sections. Um, and I'm just looping through it, and I'm appending those into the DOM. It works. Um, the D3 way to solve this is a lot more declarative. So this is the same example, exact same code. It's going to do the same thing in D3. Um, you notice that first thing I'm doing is I'm creating a, uh, well, I'm, I'm grabbing the element with D3. And then I'm binding data to that selection, to a selection. So I'm saying select all the paragraph tags. So it's creating a D3 selection for me. And that's an empty array. There are no paragraph tags. And I say, OK, now bind this data to it. And now what D3 is going to do is it's going to track that and say, all right, I have three data nodes and zero, in this case, paragraph nodes in the DOM. I need to do something to bring those in. And you tell it how to do it. So for every, new, every node that doesn't exist in the DOM, append a paragraph and set the HTML to this. So it, it is a contrived example. I, I understand that. Um, and I can hear the question now, wait a minute, that's 11 lines of code. The other one was eight lines of code. And you're right. Um, <laughs> that, that, that's true. Um, I did make this one a little bit longer for readability because we're talking about D3. Um, but let's talk about what this gives you that the other one doesn't. So do, this code right here has the exact same result as my previous code. You notice that for loop? I'm telling D3 to enter a thousand times. So let's say that I'm, that's simulating a user interaction with the page. It's a little contrived because paragraphs, you don't always have like adding and removing paragraphs. Um, but this will have the same result instead of 3,000 paragraph tags that we would have here. Um, and so that's because D3 is tracking that. Now, that's not super useful when we get into, um, when we get into a paragraph tag. But it does become useful when we start talking about charts. Um, and kind of to show an example of that really quick before I get too far, let's look at NVD3. Oh, that's not the right word. Anyone curious about stock? All right, so NVD3. We have these, these are charts, a charting library that's built on top of D3. And we have three different data streams. Um, but this blue one is really spiking over here. And I don't want to look at it right now. I just want to look at the orange one. So I'm going to turn that off. So because D3 is tracking what exists in both places, I can do events like this without having a ton of extra code. Now, D3 is written in JavaScript, so you could do it all in vanilla JavaScript. Um, but why would you want to? There's a solution that already exists. Um, and it's pretty good. Now, when it comes to using SVG, scalable vector graphics, there's a couple things you need to know. Uh, at a glance, it uses an XML structure, and it draws with a painter's algorithm. Um, and so what that means is it looks like HTML. It has its own tags, though, so you need to learn those as you're going. Uh, in this case, an SVG tag would be the root node, and all of these sibling tabs are, or tags are circles. And they all have their own attributes. You can see it here. If we have time, I'll show you the code that generated that. And a painter's algorithm, that means that things that are drawn first, just like you're painting on a canvas, end up on the bottom. So I draw my mountains, I draw some grass, and then I draw some trees. I can't get the mountains on top of the trees unless I draw them last. So we're going to enter some code here. You're here for code. You're not here to hear me talk. So I have a server that I spun up. Um, and it's in the GitHub repo that I neglected to show you. So <laughs> it's github.com slash the McMurder. Um, it's a play on my last name. I'm very clever. And then it's the Utah JS 2015 conference, D3JS. There's another repo that's almost exactly the same. The slides are a little different. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to build this together. So you notice that when it draws, it has this nice animation. It has some user interactions. These are, I, uh, I guess, a cheap interaction that I have put in there so I can show you how to make them. 
Um, and we're going to walk through the code and look at the changes at each step. So here's the code. Can everyone see that, or do I need to make it larger? OK. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to include D3, obviously. Um, and we have a, a container, a div that we're going to build everything inside. And we're going to set up some of our initial variables, like our height and width of our canvas. Uh, we're going to have a margin. Um, we want a little bit of padding around the canvas so we don't use the whole canvas so that the axes show up correctly. Um, and that's just kind of a gotcha with the D3 helper SVG axes, is that they don't always draw within the bounds. You have to give a little bit of padding so that the letters or numbers and uh, values show up correctly. So uh, in here, I'm just setting up some variables, nothing too exciting, and my data. So this is the data array I'll be working with the entire time. It's a title with a, with a string value and then a, a value with a numeric value. So we're going to use two different types of axes. Um, so this one's boring to look at. We're going to skip to number two. Um, so in number two, I'm going to add a little bit of code. I'm going to build the SVG. Now, you could have the SVG already existing and select it. I'm just going to build it right here. Uh, I'm selecting the container, appending an SVG, and setting height and width. Nothing too exciting yet. Um, and then I'm creating a group. Now, a group is just a logical way to group elements together. Um, and I can show you what that looks like. Let's look at step one, which is boring, and then step two. So here we have our SVG, and we've appended a group to it. And you notice that I've translated the group over for my margin. So I'm going to build everything inside that group. Is that too s Thank you. Let's make that larger. Is that easier to see now? Perfect. Thank you for that feedback. If I'm going too fast, let me know. Um, I'm trying to condense everything. <laughs> um, so we're going to jump to step three, where we actually start doing something. And just like before, we're going to create a variable that is a D3 selection. And we're going to select all of the rectangles with the MyBar class. And then we're going to bind our data to that. So this is a fancy way of telling D3 to track what's going on in the data and what's going on in the DOM. So it can compare them and intelligently enter nodes and exit nodes, and even update nodes. But we'll get into that uh, at the end. We're just going to talk about how to create new nodes. Um, I personally really like the API working with D3. Uh, it's very clean. Um, and I've, I've given you a couple examples. So I've applied attributes with a string and then another string in this case. Up here I was doing it with a uh, string and then the value. But you can also do so, you can also apply them with objects and with classes they give you a special class uh, which allows you to toggle things if you need to. So in this case I'm saying for every bar that I have in data that I don't have in the DOM, I'm going to create a new rectangle element. I'm going to give it the class of my bar, and I'm going to set these x, y, height, and width values, as well as give it a, a style. So what that actually looks like, we've just created our first bar chart. It's pretty cool. It doesn't do anything, and it can't be read. But it exists. One of the fun things about working with D3 is it's very visual. Um, if I did that wrong, the bars wouldn't appear, and I would know I did something wrong. Um, so we're going to jump ahead to step four. We're going to actually start doing something with that data, make it a little bit uh, more readable. So in step four, uh, and all, I should say all of this code is in the repo. It walks through. There's this new code. You can see it step by step. And at the end, there's a lot of additional um, resources that I'll provide to help you learn if you'd like to follow along with this or, you, or not. That's fine, too. Um, in this one, we're going to add a scale. So there's a difference in D3 between a scale and an axis. An axis exists uh, on the DOM, and the scale is what the axis represents. Um, so here we're creating a scale by first getting the max value so that I know what range my scale needs to display. And then I'm creating it with uh, the first the lowest value being 0 and the max value being whatever the max value is. And then I can set a range. So I can tell D3 to map it for me, figure out the math, I don't want to have to worry about it. So I could have 300 pixels to work with, but 12 or 1,100 pixels of, or 1,100 values. And D3 will figure out the conversion for me. 
And then um, I'm setting some bar stuff here that we're going to remove later, so I'm going to just skip over it. I can say, for my width of each bar, give me the scale, the scaled value. Um, and so in D3, when you're using a function to set a property, it gives you two variables immediately. The first variable is your data, and the second variable is an iterator. So I've called them D and I. It's kind of the common syntax that Mike Bostock has given in all of his examples. Uh, so what I'm saying here is, for each data item, run the value through the scale and apply that as the width of the bar. So what we end up seeing is this. So it, it's great. You can see that there's a difference in values, but we don't have a scale. And uh, if we start adding more bars, we're going to have run into a problem because we're manually computing the y. So let's take a look at step five. In step five, we're going to actually apply the axis by using the D3 helper, D3.SVG.axis, give it the scale and an orientation. And then we're going to append that axis to the DOM by using the dot call method. Uh, and notice I'm, I'm, what I'm actually doing is creating a group, giving it a class, and then translating that group to the place that I want it to exist, and then calling the axis. So step five looks like this. So we have our first scale and axis, and we can see that the bars actually mean something. But I don't have any labels. Um, I can't add more bars. We have more work to do. And I'm kind of picky about how things look, so I'm going to change that so it looks a little nicer. Um, any questions so far? I know I'm moving fast. Um, I don't know if we'll have, actually, we, we, have to, we won't have time for questions at the end. They said that. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add those labels on the left axis. Um, and in this case, we're just creating the scale. We're not actually adding the axis or even using it um, in this step. So we're creating the scale the same way. Now notice that we used an ordinal scale rather than a linear scale. It's because we're dealing with strings instead of numbers. And D3 can't uh, ordinally map strings. So we're, t uh, I'm sorry, can't linearly map strings. So we're using an ordinal scale, which will keep track of the strings as part of the scale. And I give it a domain, just like before. And I give it a range. And I use a slightly different syntax here because I'm rounding rather than doing uh, pixel perfect uh, counts. So I'm giving it a range here. And then I'm adding a, a margin between the bars. And it's a percent. In this case, it's something we initialized at 10%. So that's our new code there. I'm going to skip to step seven because this is where we actually implement it. Um, and so the first thing you'll see is we got rid of this manual calculation and we're using the scale. So now we're saying for every data entry, we're going to enter it. The Y attribute will be based on the scale and we'll pass in the title and it will return the location that it needs to go in. Um, and we're, and then in, so let's look at that. So this step six, like I said, we didn't do anything with it. But in step seven, here's where we actually implemented it. So you notice that rather the bars change slightly because now they're calculated. And the nice, the nice part about that is I can come up here to my data and I can uh, add more data. And it's going to work, provided the keys are all differently, are all different. Oh, thank you. This is what happens when I live code, which is why I did it all in advance. All right, and so you can see that it's calculating the height of each bar for me. I don't have to worry about it. I can just tell it what to do, and it does it for me, rather than having to calculate everything by myself. So this is pretty cool. Um, in not so many lines of code, we have, uh, let's see, it's a script, so 14 to this, I've got some extra styling, and I, my, my styling requires things to be on different lines. But I mean, I'm at 40 or 50, maybe 60 lines of code, and I have a working bar chart that I can reuse as many times as I want. I can send data to it, and it will draw, as long as the data matches the format. But we're still not showing labels. Um, so we're going to add that, ax that axis the same way we did previously, create the axis. Um, and we're going to, we create the axis first. We're orienting it slightly differently because it's on the left side of the chart. 
We're appending a group, translating that group, and calling the axis. Um, so it's the same stuff before, and now we have an axis. So here we have an actual chart that we could uh, ship. But I want user interactions because I think they're cool, um, and there are legitimate use cases for user interactions. In this one, it's a little contrived. So it's as easy as taking our D3 selection we created at the very beginning and adding an event on mouse over. You, so you give it a function, and the first item is the, is the node, or this in, in, in this situation is the node. So I'm going to select the node, um, and I'm going to apply a transition. Now, whenever you say dot transition, everything you apply after that is a transition. So I say, here's my style. I want you to change it to this color. And when I mouse out, I want you to change it back to steel blue. So let's take a look at that step. And you see that I have a nice animation. Um, but just for fun, I can change the duration. So let's make it something crazy like five seconds. Might be painful. Yeah. <laughs> Now we're talking, let's ship this. <laughs> All right. Real quick question. Yes. You said your functions usually get a data and an index. Do these help count your These data? ones do not. Okay. Um, because it's, uh, it's happening, well, that's a good question. My, my gut reaction is no, but I've never tried it. So, which is why I'm doing a D3 select this rather than manipulating the, and in this case, I, I only have the HTML node because it's an event on the existing node with a mouse over. Um, and so our final step is going to be adding a transition in. Um, so our new code is right here. There's two steps to this. First, for a transition, we have to have something to transition from. So instead of setting the width immediately, I'm setting it to zero so that I can transition from zero to something. If I didn't set it and just tried to transition it, <coughs> D3 wouldn't know what to do. Um, so I'm actually going to remove this little bit of code. And so we're, we have a style, just like before, transition. We're transitioning the width of each bar to its scaled value. So what that looks like, actually, did I save that? Here we go. What that looks like is this. We have a fun slide in. That transition's a little fast. Um, so I'm going to up the duration um, so that it's a little easier to follow. But there's a lot of things moving at once. So I'm also going to add a delay for each one. So and this gets the data and the index. And I'm just going to uh, add a slight delay to each one so that they come in staged. It looks a little nicer. It's easier to follow. So this would be your first bar chart in D3 in uh, like 10, 15 minutes. Um, now, there are a couple issues with this bar chart. First is that it doesn't really handle any user interactions. Let's say my data changes. Let's say I'm allowing users to enter data. The chart's going to enter, but what if they are deleting nodes? Chart isn't equipped to handle that. I'm only using D3's enter, which checks for elements that exist in the data array, but not in the DOM. And so I think I'm out of time. Is that correct? What do I go to? 55. 55? Oh, man, I flew. Woo! Do we have questions now? Uh, no. <laughs> All right. So that's our first bar chart. Let's talk about the three different ways D3 works with the DOM. You saw some really cool examples where things were sliding on my clicks. I was removing whole data streams. Our chart can't do that because it's, not, it's only using enter. If I want to use update or exit, I have to change things. So as part of my server, including that D3 uh, repository, I have this tiny example. Now, a caveat to this example, D3 is kind of meant to handle everything. And I had to like rip control away from D3 to do it in stages to make it a little easier to see. Um, and so the code for this is, is good. It works. That's how you know it's good. It works. <laughs> um, but it may not be the best example to learn from. There are better examples. Um, so you can see my data array here. I have two items that don't exist in the DOM. In this case, I'm entering circles at a static radius. So I click Enter, and they come in. Now, no, I want them to, the radius to reflect in their value, and that happens in the update. So I can click Update as much as I want, 
it's not going to do anything because they've already been updated. It actually is running code, but because there's nothing to transition, you don't see it. So let's enter. They already exist. Exit. Nothing's happening. So let's change our data. So we're adding a new. Uh, two, all the values are different. So I can do an enter, and it's going to add the value. If I want to update those values, including the ones that already exist, I'll need to run update. And again, exit won't do anything. So let me get one that's large. This is just random. So there we go. So I have a bunch of examples there. And let's find one that's small. So enter isn't going to do anything. There are existing nodes. And update will exist the nodes that it needs to use. And now exit is going to take those nodes and apply a transition. They'll turn red, then shrink, and then be removed from the DOM. So normally all that would happen in, in your code rather than at a user interaction. I found that this is kind of the easiest way to explain the different events is staged. So existing data points that don't have a node are entered. Data points that do have a node are updated. And data points that are nodes that don't have a data point are exited. Um, in D3 code, you use dot .enter and dot .exit. And then update is um, called on the selection. So in this case, and actually we can even look at this code. That will probably explain things. So what I, I have my, my circle uh, selection, which I'm binding data in a function so that I can do it over and over uh, because the data is changing. Um, and then on my update, there's not a dot update, where on the exit, there is a dot exit. So update is implicit, and uh, exit and enter are implicit. You have to tell it what to do. Did I say that backwards? Whatever. You know what I mean. Um, so for update, it's taking the entire array that exists and updating it to its values. So it's iterating through the array just like an enter would, and it's by our attributes. One of the simplest way to explain probably the most complex part of D3 um, or understanding how to work with D3. Um, so let's go back to this one. Some cool ways to learn D3. Um, obviously, the D3 docs, they're very, um, very well documented. Uh, but there are these two additional tools. The gentleman who created D3, his name was Mike Bostock. And so he created blocks.org. Um, and what that, or it's bl.ocks.org. What it does is it'll, it takes your GitHub gists and pulls them into a block or an example. So in this case, I showed you one of my blocks, which is a GitHub gist. These are all of my GitHub gists. Um, so this is the one I, I mentioned earlier. It's just a bunch of moving circles. That's it. It was for fun. Uh, that was where I got the, the SVG with the child elements of circles. And this is a, a block. If I go to GitHub, uh, GitHub gist, it gives me the ID, and I can look at it there. So these are mine, um, and they're not that cool. But if I look at Mike Bostock's and Bostock, I can see that he has plenty of examples of how to use D3. And it just keeps going. So let's pick uh, a cool one like this. This is a globe. It's in D3, um, and he's using a, a topo JSON uh, of the planet Earth. And he has a projection that he's applying to that topo JSON, and it gives you step by step how to build this. Um, it's really great to learn. Uh, I think I'm out of time. If you want to leave, you can leave. Um, if you want to ask questions, you can keep asking questions, which I haven't let you do yet. Um, <laughs> So there's a lot of resources to learn. And Block Explorer allows you to search all of the blocks by the API it uses. So if I wanted to figure out how to use this projection, I could, or I could search for d3.geo.orthographic. And it would come up with this as a result. There's also some other sources. Um, D3.js, the documentation. Mike Bostock's personal website gives a lot of examples. And you can use this D3 presentation I just gave. Um, so that's it for the presentation. I barely made it. Um, thank you.